What's up, everybody? Welcome to this course titled Buffer Overflows Made Easy, brought to you by me, the Cyber Mentor. In this course, I'm going to be teaching you how to perform a 32-bit Windows buffer overflow attack and make it seem easy in the process. So this is going to be a hands-on course. We're going to be using Windows and Kali Linux, and we're not going to be doing any death by PowerPoint outside of a little bit in this first video. So we're going to break it down step by step into individual videos. And by the end of it, you should be able to perform a 32 bit Windows buffer overflow attack on your own. So let's talk about some of the things that we're going to be seeing. So we're going to cover quickly anatomy of memory, anatomy of the stack, and then we're going to talk about the buffer overflow walkthrough, but we're going to be doing that in the hands on portion. So let's talk about anatomy of memory. So when we talk about anatomy of memory, we have the kernel at the top and we've got text at the bottom. So if you think of your kernel, think of your command line. You can also think about this as a bunch of ones and your text you can think about as your read only code and you can think about that as a bunch of zeros. So this is only for informational purposes, but we can also call this the kernel the top, the text the bottom. Where we're really going to be focused on though is going to be the stack. So if we dive into this memory here and we dive even deeper and we go into the stack, it's kind of similar. So we have these registers here and I'll provide links down below on how to brush up on some of these registers if you're not familiar. But the important things what we need to know for this lesson is that you have the ESP, you have your buffer space, your EBP and your EIP. So we can think about this again as the ESP sitting at the top, and the EBP sitting as the bottom. So what happens is you have this buffer space and this buffer space fills up with characters. So the buffer space is going to go downward. What should happen is if you're properly sanitizing your buffer space, then if you send a bunch of characters at it, say a bunch of A's, for example, like this, you should reach the EBP, but stop. The buffer space should be able to contain the characters that you're sending. Now, however, if you have a buffer overflow attack, then you actually overflow the buffer space you're using and reach over the EBP and into something called the EIP. Now the EIP is where things get interesting. This is a pointer address or a return address. So what we can do is we can use this address to point to directions that we instruct. Now these directions are actually going to be malicious code that gives us a reverse shell. So we're going to learn that later on in future videos as we go step by step. So this doesn't have to seem uh, very logical right now. You just have to very, very base level understand that what's happening in the stack is that you're overflowing buffer space. So if you can write over the buffer space and write down all the way to the EIP, you can control the stack and you can control the pointer. And eventually you can have a reverse shell, which will lead to root. So it's going to make a lot more sense when we dive into hands-on. This is just more of a theoretical thing. So let's talk about really quick the steps to conduct a buffer overflow. So the first step we're going to cover is called spiking. So spiking is going to be a method that we use to find a vulnerable part of a program. Once we find the vulnerable part of the program, we're going to do fuzzing, which is kind of similar to spiking. So fuzzing, we're going to send a bunch of characters add a program and see if we can break it. If we do break it, we want to find out at what point we can, we did break it, right? So we want to find something called the offset and we use that offset to overwrite the EIP, that pointer address that we we're talking about. Once we have the EIP controlled, we need to do a few house cleanup things. One is called finding bad characters. The other is called finding the right module. This doesn't need to make sense right now. But once we do that and we have this information from steps five and six, we can generate shell code, this malicious shell code that will allow us to get this reverse shell. So we're going to use that. We're going to point that EIP to our malicious shell code, and hopefully we're going to gain root. So again, this will all make sense as we dive into the future videos and we get hands on. So if you look at these videos, these are the videos that are going to come. So our next video is going to be on spiking. Second one's going to be on fuzzing and so on. So if you have trouble with one area in particular, you can watch that area specifically and not have to look through a long video and hopefully break this down into little nuggets. So 
last thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about the tools we're going to be using in this course. So I have a victim machine. I'm sitting on Windows 10 Pro. You do not have to be on Windows 10 Pro. You could be on a different type of machine, but Windows is critical for this as Volan Server runs on Windows. So if you're running Windows 7, that's fine. Your return address may be different than mine, but if you follow the steps in what I tell you through the course, you should have no issue getting root. So as I've mentioned before, we're going to be using something called Voln Server. That is our vulnerable software that we're going to be running on Windows. This is what's going to allow us to exploit and attack the software and gain root. So our attacker machine is going to be Kali Linux. You do not have to use Kali Linux. It is what I'm going to be using through the course. I do recommend any sort of virtual machine that you have. Uh, it could be Ubuntu or some form of Linux or something you're comfortable with writing Python in. And lastly, on our Windows machine as well, the victim machine, we're going to be running something called Immunity Debugger. So all of these tools are going to be your homework to be installed. Let's go ahead and just talk about them real quick. I'm going to open up Internet Explorer here, or actually Edge. And what we're going to do is I've just pulled up the Google, and I'm just going to kind of show you here what we're going to do. So for Voln Server, if you Google Voln Server, you're going to go to the gray corner. You click on the gray corner. You scroll down just a little bit. I want you to download this volnserver.zip and extract it to a folder. From there on, we're going to be running Voln Server repeatedly, so make sure you know where this is at. Same goes for Immunity Debugger. You can download it here. If you see download the latest Immunity Debugger here, there's going to be this register page that you have to do. You can put in fake information if you're not comfortable giving your real information. It'll still download regardless. So all you need to do here is download Immunity and install it on your Windows machine. So again, we're going to have the Voln Server and Immunity on the Windows machine. If you want to follow along with what I'm doing on the VM side of the house, then I am using VMware Pro, but Pro does cost money, so you can use a workstation. So what you can do is you can say VMware Workstation Download and just look for VMware Workstation Player right here. You can click this link and go into the download page. Again, you'll be running that on your base machine. So if that's Windows, then this is what you're going to run it on. And you can do this in reverse. So if you're running Windows on a VM, that's fine. Just understand that I'm running Windows as a base. Okay, so once you have your desired workstation installed and your VM installed, you can download Kali Linux if you'd like. So don't go to the official Kali Linux download page. I actually prefer the Kali Linux custom image page if you scroll a little bit down and you click on this page here. What's nice is that they give you the VMware or if you're a VirtualBox person, you can get the VirtualBox image as well. So we do the VMware image. If you have a torrent software, um, go ahead and click torrent. If not, you're going to have to download torrent software. I recommend uTorrent or BitTorrent. Go ahead, torrent that, download this, and get Kali up and running. Should be pretty straightforward on that. The default password is Tor, as you see here. And of course, root is the default user. So once you have all of this set up, let's go ahead and join me in the next video.